I look forward, as Pastor Randall said, to maybe having lunch with some of you folks who are new to our church right after this service here. But, uh, but first, the word, and I got to tell you, I've been nervous all week about preaching this particular word to, to this church. And I just preached it to the first service, and I'm still nervous um, because of, of the subject matter. I don't get nervous very often talking in front of people anymore, but this, this week, I've, I've been a little edgy, been a little edgy. And uh, before we jump into the topic, let me tell you why I want to talk about this. Because I want this place to be a place where we can talk about real things that happen in real life to us. And I want the marriages in this church to be the best marriages around. If you go to church here, I want, I want you to be so fed that you take it out into your houses. And your houses are like lighthouses in your communities instead of black holes in your communities. You know what I'm talking about? So that's, that's what I want. That's my heart. And so uh, with, with that said, we're going to jump into this message today. It's called Four Easy Steps to Having an Affair. I want to talk to you today about how you can have an affair. And yes, you, even you can have an affair. And um, I, I, I suppose you could see this as part two to the message that I started last week on cell phone use in the family, because statistically... If an affair is going to happen to you or in your house, it's going to begin, guess where? On your phone. And so this is kind of part two to that. Four easy steps to having an affair. And, and so this is obviously a really important topic to us. Because what we see is that 20% of all of us, Christians and non-Christians, 20% of us will at some point have a sexual affair. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of us. 20% of the people in this room, if we believe the statistics, but see, I believe through Christ, we can become more than a statistic, okay? And, and, and that's if you don't include emotional affairs in the number. I'll give you that number in just a second, but I, I do. Uh, let me define an affair for you. I'll put this on the screen for you. An affair is you, everybody say me, is you giving any part of your romantic self to a person other than your spouse. It's you giving any part, any part of your romantic self, any part that includes uh, you sexually, uh, you textually, you uh, Facebookally, I don't know, you, you emotionally, you spiritually, any part of your romantic self to another person. And so that, when you enlarge the definition to include what's become known as emotional affairs, cyber affairs, the number jumps to 45% of all of us, one out of two of us basically, at some point having an affair. So, so yes, having an affair based on the statistics is obviously a pretty important part of being married. And I'm a cutting edge preacher. So I want to help you get there. I, I want to help you to, to finish maybe out your goal because apparently it's a big goal for some of us based on the numbers and talk to you about how you too can have an affair. To, to get us there, we're going to start with the Word of God. I'm going to be reading to you this morning from 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, if you'll go ahead and find your way there, I will tell you 2 Samuel chapter 12 has in it what I call my own personal tattoo verse. Like if I ever, I don't have a tattoo, but if I ever get a tattoo, it's going to come from a verse in 2 Samuel chapter 12. I'll give you the verse in just a second because I don't want to spoil it. Some of you have such amazing tattoos and some of you have Bible verses and other languages on, on your bodies and that's great. Mine is 2 Samuel chapter 12. After you've uh, found your way there, go ahead and stand up and we're going to read this together. My kids, my kids asked me the other night, they said, they said, Dad, why don't you have a tattoo? And I said, I, don't, I might get one someday, but I'm just trying to decide if I want to put a bumper sticker on a Mercedes. That's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to figure out. That's funny right there. So this is my, feel free to use that. This is my tattoo verse. It's 2 Samuel chapter 12. I'm not even going to have to read it. I know it by heart. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7. And it goes like this, 
you are the man. What would that make an amazing tattoo? You are the man. Like, just put it in Hebrew right on your arm there so that people ask you what it says. It says, I'm the man. That's what it says, you know? That's, that's, that's my personal tattoo verse. Except, here's the problem with it. When you read this verse in context, when you read it in context, you don't want to be this man. Don't be this man. Don't be, this, don't be a woman like this. Because what is going on here is the prophet Nathan, basically their preacher, is confronting King David. Now, you all know King David. He's a man, the Bible says, who's after the very heart of God. He is confronting King David with a story about how somebody, wink, wink, in David's kingdom has just had an affair and has killed the husband. And David is so blind to his own sin that he doesn't even realize that it's him. And, and, the, and the prophet is like, no, bro, it's you. You are the man. And what we learn is that this man who was after the very heart of God has gone so far down the affair pathway that he doesn't even realize that he's that guy. He's turned into a guy he never thought he would be. He's done something he never imagined he was capable of. And, and it shocks him. And we're going we're gonna to focus on this story today. And, and as I'm helping you, as I'm helping you to have your affair, I, I want you to think this. Because you, you might think, hey, I, I don't know, never me. It couldn't be me. Maybe you're like David. And you're further down the road than you think you are. So be encouraged. Maybe you're already taking steps to your affair, towards it. And you don't even know it. I'm going to help you finish out that journey today. Before you find your way to your seat, I want you to say hello, high five, fist bump a few people and tell them, don't be that man. Don't be that woman. Don't you be that man. Don't you be that woman. You are the man. Lord Jesus. You wear wear white pants too. All right, all right. So how, how, oh how, does David's family end up here? How does he get here? Before I give you your four steps, I know you all cannot wait, I can tell. You're anxious to get this thing moving. Before I get there... I want to trace just how David ends up here. So we were just reading from 2 Samuel chapter 12. I want to back up one chapter to where the story begins. So I'm in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, okay? And the Bible says in verse 1, In the spring, at the time of year when kings go to war, David, who is king, King David, who is married, David stays at home. But he dispatches Joab. Who is Joab? Joab is David's general. I'm teaching you some Bible trivia this morning. You you can remember it like this. He's General Joab. General Joab, he sends him off with his fighting men in full force to destroy the Ammonites for good. So pay attention to what's going on. It's the time of year when kings should be going to war, but David stays home. But he sends his men out to fight a war for him. Okay? Then the Bible says, one late afternoon... David got up from taking his nap and was nothing like a Sunday afternoon nap is their church. One late afternoon, David got up from taking his nap and was strolling on the roof of the palace. From his vantage point on the roof, he saw, he sees this woman bathing. Her name is Bathsheba. And David's story of having an affair begins with David, the man after God's own heart, being a peeping Tom. David just out strolling one day, and he's like, whoa, there's a naked woman right there. And, and David can't help it, right? I mean, you see what you see. There, there are things that come across your path because it's a big world, and they, they happen to you, or you, you see what you see. My daddy used to say it like this. Everybody's got to look once. You can't help what you see. But you don't got to look twice, right? Like, if, I, if I'm in Target just... You know, walking down the aisle and hot young thing starts walking towards me in her short mini skirt the size of a postage stamp. I got, 
I got to... I got to look once because life happens, right? But I don't have to look twice. I don't have to keep looking, right? It, it, it's, um, I call it the bounce and look somewhere else. Like I see hot young thing, go oh, bounce and look somewhere else. You know, bounce and look somewhere else. Like you get a text on your phone, ladies, from somebody not your husband, and you can't help that you saw the text, but what you can help is your response. You don't have to respond. You can delete and bounce and go somewhere else. Bounce and look somewhere else. In the Bible, Job, who was a righteous man, makes a statement. And I love how Job says it. Job said, listen, I made a covenant with my eyes not to even look on another woman, not my wife. That's powerful. I made a promise with my eyes. We're going to bounce and look somewhere else. That's what Job is saying there. And so David has a decision to make here. Whoa, there's hot young thing over there and she's naked. David has a choice. He can keep looking, he can look again, or he can bounce and look somewhere else. Let's see where he, let's see where he lands. I think we all know. The Bible goes on and it says, the woman was stunningly beautiful. So, so from this, we know that, it's, that, that she's stunningly beautiful. David is not just looking once. He's not just looking twice, but he's staring now. Right? Stunningly beautiful. In the original Hebrew, that is translated as, she was hot. <laughs> Check it up in Strong's. She's, she's a 10. She's fine. <laughs> That's what's going on here. She's a beautiful woman. And so David could stop here, you know. He's looked, but he hasn't gone any further. But the story goes on, and it says, David sends some people to ask about her. Let me tell you, in our day and age, what David would be doing is he'd be going on to her Instagram and stalking her. You know how we stalk people online, right? You know how we are. So that's what he's doing. He's stalking. David says, let's find out about her. And they say she's Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam and wife. Everybody say wife. 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 Of Uriah the Hittite. Now still, David can stop here. He's not, he's, he's not yet had an affair. He finds out she's married to somebody else. She belongs with somebody else. He can stop the whole thing right here. But the story keeps going. And it says David sends his agents out to get her. This is, all, this is very third grade when you think about it. You know how like when you were in third grade and there was that special somebody that you liked? You'd make, you'd make up a little letter. It says, will you go with me? We didn't know where we were going. We were going somewhere. You know? And you gave her some options, yes or no. And then you wouldn't take the letter yourself. No, 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 no. You would send one of your friends to take the letter to that special somebody. I got a letter like that once and I read yes or no. I was interested in another girl, so I penciled in another mark that said, maybe so, we'll see. And check that one. You know? Sorry. I'm talking about David. He sends him out to get her. After she arrives, he goes to bed with her. And so the affair is now on. Maybe you know the story. A couple of weeks later, Bathsheba looks down at her little white stick, and it's turned blue. And uh-oh, somebody's got some splaining to do. This is scandalous. This is scandalous. This is bigger than Kevin Hart having an affair. This is bigger than Tiger Woods having an affair. This is bigger than every Kardashian having an affair. This is the king. This is scandalous. And so David, David sends for the husband, Uriah, who's out fighting the king's battle for him. The husband gets back. And um, David has a choice again. Like This can end now. He's made a mistake, but it can end now. Let me just say this. I feel the Lord in this. If you've made a mistake in your marriage, your, per, your, your present marriage, your last marriage, if you're presently making a mistake, I want you to know that the grace of God is big enough to, to, to find you and to rescue you and set you back on the right track. Wherever you are, however far you've gone, you've not gone so far, but that the blood of Jesus Christ can't find you and wash you clean every single time. And I know that because even after David makes all these mistakes, scripturally, even after that, God yet again calls David a man after his own heart. David is restored. 
Jesus, who is a descendant of David, will come onto the scene generations later. And Jesus announces himself to the world, not as the son of Abraham, the great Abraham, but as the son of David. And so Jesus is, is embodying this idea that you can get your groove back. You can find your way again. Jesus in his very lineage shows us that families can be restored. I'm here to tell you, your family can be restored. Your family can be restored. It can be restored better than it's ever been. But David first has to deal with the issues. David can stop it here. He can repent here, but he doesn't. David engages in what I call Operation Switcheroo. David, David tries to get the husband drunk, Uriah drunk, so that the husband will go sleep with his own wife, so that the husband will then think that the baby is actually the husband's and not David's. It's Operation Switcheroo. Sounds like a great plan, right? Except Uriah doesn't play that. Uriah, the husband, claps back to David, and he says to him, he said, King, what, <laughs> you know this had to sting David. He says, what kind of man would I be? To find comfort in my wife while your men are out fighting a battle in your name. Ooh, you know that had to cut David, don't you? So Operation Switcheroo quickly fails. And then what David does next, you all, David could come clean here. He could. What David does next, though, is just cold. David sends Uriah back to the battle to General Joab with a note. It's not a love note. It's a death note. And it says, put Uriah at the front of the fighting line so that he will be killed. And David, the man after God's own heart, does one of the coldest things you can do. He sends the dude back to his own fate with his own death note in his pocket. And David, the man after God's own heart, is now a murderer because of this affair. I know what you're all thinking. I know. I can tell. Pastor, please tell me how I can get, in the, get involved in this affair action. Tell me. This sounds so exciting, how I can have an affair. I can, I can feel the excitement. So, so without any further ado, the setup is over. I want to give you four ways, four steps for you to have an affair. Step one. Everybody say step one. Yeah. Step one is to believe that you are invincible. To believe that it could never happen to you. Oh, pastor, you don't understand. It really couldn't happen to me. Not, not really. I mean, my, me and my husband, me and my wife, me and my boo, we love each other. We are in love. I could never. He could never. She could never. And if you think that, congratulations. You are well on the path to having an affair. Just keep thinking that. I could never. I, I mean, David probably thought something like that too. David's a pretty good guy. He's man after God's own heart. Da David killed the giant. He's a, an ancestor of Jesus. David wrote more Psalms than anybody else. When's the last time, let me ask you a question. When's the last time you wrote a book of the Bible or a chapter? Hey, when's the last time you wrote a verse in the Bible? If it happened to David, don't you think it could happen to you too? But we're so happy. No, no, no. Statistically, listen, happiness is not a bar or really even an indicator to whether you're going to have an affair in a marriage. It's not. It's not. Uh, as a matter of fact, plenty of happy marriages, plenty have affairs that happen in them. In other words, affairs just happen. Let me give you some good news. You don't even have to plan to have an affair. Not planning kind of makes you eligible to have an affair. You know what you do have to plan for? To not have an affair. So if you don't have a plan to not have an affair, keep going. Congratulations. You're going further down the road. 30% of all pastors will have a sexual affair. Pastors, 
That's, that's not even including the larger definition of emotional affairs. 30% of pastors will have a sexual affair. That's compared to just 20% of regular people. 30%. That's crazy. Affairs just happen to people who think, not me. And so if you want to have an affair, keep thinking that you can text without effect. Keep thinking that you can touch without repercussion. Keep thinking that you can be alone in somebody else's home and you'll find yourself there. Keep thinking, not me. I'm invincible. See, plenty of people stand across from that special somebody on their wedding day at the altar. And plenty of people look into the eyes of that special someone and they think, she's so beautiful He's so handsome. Plenty of people think that. But nobody thinks she's so beautiful. And someday I'm going to cheat on her. Someday he's so handsome. Someday I'm going to cheat on that boy. Nobody thinks that. Plenty of people, though, think, not me, not us. We're special. If you want to have an affair... Keep thinking that. Number one, step one is to believe that you are invincible. Now we're on to step two. Everybody say step two. Isn't this exciting? I'm educating you on how you can do this. Step two is to take baby steps. Baby steps, just a little baby step. Speaking of things that nobody ever really thinks. Nobody wakes up one morning and says, oh, today's the day. Today is the day I cheat on my wife. Today is the day I have an affair on my husband. Today, nobody does that. They don't. Plenty of people wake up, though, and they see, oh, who is this that texted? Oh, why is he texting me? Let me respond. Plenty of people take just baby steps. They push the envelope just a little bit. in their. You know what I'm talking about. They push the envelope just a little bit in their marriage. So if you want to have an affair, take baby steps, just just a little step, just a little bit. Just um, just send, send that Facebook message, that Instagram direct message that you'll have to delete in five minutes. By the way, If you're deleting your browser history and you're deleting messages and text, bravo, keep up the good work. You're so close to having an affair, you can probably almost taste it. I'm just just going to have it delete one time, just one time, just one step. Or go out on that business lunch with Hot Young Thing. I mean, it's business. We're talking about business, y'all. Business. It's not even dinner. There are no candles. There's plenty of people around. It's just business. Just, just a little step. Just, 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 just a little one. You go, or, or just call her up. Call him up and talk about church ministry. Yeah. Use the church as an excuse to sin. Do that. That'll make sure you have an affair. Just take a step. How does David end up becoming a murderer. He took steps. David's first step was he looked, and then he looked, actually, before David even looks, let's back up a little further, because something set David up for this. There were some danger zones. Remember how when we first started reading, we read, it was the time of year when kings go to war, but David stayed home. You remember how we read that? Let, let Let me state that to you in full context. It was the time of year when kings go to war, but King David, the giant killer, stayed home. It was a time of year when kings go to war, but King David, the warrior's warrior, the man's man, stays home. And you get the feeling that what sets David up for this moment is that the giant killer has burned out. That he's lost his way. You can just feel it. He's sleeping in the middle of the work day. If you want to know a danger zone in your marriage to having an affair, 
You want to know what danger zone? It's when one of you is burning out, one of you is depressed, one of you is ready to give up. A few years ago when we were building this building, I was entering one of those, one of those places. And I told my wife, I said, baby, I just, I'm just so depressed and I'm burnt out. I'm just, I'm tired of all this construction stuff. And, and my wife, sensing that, that I needed to be pulled out of this, pulls me out. You know what she does? Every day for the next two weeks, my wife brings me just a little gift. Like I remember one day she brought me a letter from my kids that told me all the reasons that they loved me. And then another day she surprised me with lunch. And then another day she brought me a, just a little compass that you could clip to your keychain. And she said, you're the leader of our family and we trust you. And then another day, well, I can't tell you what we did on that day. I can't tell you how she surprised me on that day. But my wife pulled me out of all of that. It, 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 if, if, you, if you want to have an affair, ignore the red flags. Ignore the red flags. Hey, as a matter of fact, last week I told you, I really want us to become a note-keeping church. So I'm about to give you three quick notes I want you all to take. Okay, everybody get your phones out. Get your phones out. Everybody, everybody, everybody. Here, you're not too cool for school. Get your phones out. Open up your notes app. These are three real quick danger zones you need to recognize in you and your spouse. I've already given you the first one. The first one, the first one is depression or burnout in either of you. That's a danger zone. Type that in. Depression or burnout. A second one is this. If you've had a baby in the last 18 to 24 months, you're in a danger zone. But babies are so cute. Why? Because those little suckers will suck the life out of you. That's why. They will turn you into people you never thought you could be. It's like terrorist torture dealing with these, these creatures sometimes. So number two is you've had a baby recently. Number three, type this in. You are in job or life transition. You're starting a new job. You just got fired from a job. You just got a promotion at a job. You've just retired from your job. These three things are all powerful danger zones that you need to recognize. And if you want to have an affair, just let them slide. You see that in your spouse or you see that in yourself? Just don't even mention it. Don't even mention it, and that affair can be yours. How does David end up here? Baby steps. He ignores the depression, and then he looks at Bathsheba, and he takes a baby step, and he looks again at Bathsheba, and then he internet stalks Bathsheba, and then he takes another baby step, and then he invites her over for dinner, and he's like, girl, we're just going to hang out. We'll play Xbox. We'll do like 2K on the Xbox or something. You know, it'll be fun, and then she gets over, and he's like, hey, you want to check out the new wallpaper? in the royal bedroom, and they go in the bedroom, and they sleep together, and he takes another step. And then David takes another step, and he becomes a manipulator. And he takes another step, and he becomes a murderer. How does David end up here? Baby steps. I want to read this to you from Proverbs. This is Proverbs chapter 6, verse 27. I love this. It says, can you light a fire in your pants and not expect to get burned? Isn't that good? Let me just say it again for the people in the back. Can you light a fire in your pants and not expect to get burned? If you want to have an affair, number one, think I'm immune. Think not me. Number two, take baby steps. Number three, everybody say number three. Justify it. Justify it. I deserve this. After the way he's treated me, after the way she's cut me off, I, after the way that I got abused, let me just let me stop for a second. Let me talk about abuse in a marriage. Because I get asked a lot, Pastor, what is, your, what is your theology on abuse? Can I leave my marriage if I'm being abused? And my answer is, my reading of Scripture is yes. If you are legitimately, everybody say legitimately. Legitimately being physically or emotionally abused, you have a right to to leave your marriage. You do. Now, I say legitimately because let me just give you some for instances. For instance, maybe something I've heard, maybe. It is not abuse if your husband doesn't send you flowers every Friday morning. That ain't abuse. 
That's an excuse. It's not an abuse. You know, but pastor, you don't understand. He always used to send me flowers on Friday morning. And, 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 and I just, it's my love language is flowers on Friday morning, pastor. It's abuse. No, it's not abuse. It's an excuse. It's not abuse. That, that's not a grounds for divorce. That means you need marriage counseling. And maybe girlfriend, let's just be honest. You need some counseling yourself because you set the bar way too high. You know? But justify it. I've been abused. He didn't send me flowers. I imagine David was really good at justifying what he did. So good he doesn't even realize his own sin when he's confronted with it. David probably thinks, I'm the king. I'm the king of this palace. Do you know how much pressure is on me? I'm the king. David probably thinks, I'm the giant killer. I imagine David uses this giant killer card a lot, don't you all? But you know what I did. I deserve this. You know, God understands. Speaking of cards that we all use, we all use the God understands card. Like God understands my sin. God understands I'm abused. I didn't get flowers. God understands that. No, 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 no. Listen. God does understand the temptation to sin. Hebrews says that we have a high priest who knows, how, who, who knows how we've been tempted because he was tempted in all ways like unto we are. He understands our sin and he forgives our sin and there's grace, yes. But God understanding our sin and God condoning our sin are two completely different things. And while God may forgive sin, there are still divine consequences. Sowing and reaping is a thing. It is. God understands. Let me tell you what God's real feelings are. I'm going to let God get up in his feelings here. Here's what God says about all of this in Malachi chapter 2 verse 14. I bet maybe you've never heard this verse. It says, God, not you, made marriage. God's spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. And what does God want from marriage? Children of God, people who obey, that's what. So guard the spirit of marriage within you and do not cheat on your spouse. In verse 16, God says, I hate divorce. There are very few places in the scripture that I can find where God says, I hate This is one of those places. I hate divorce, says the God of Israel, God of the angel armies. I hate, listen to this, the violent dismembering of the one flesh of marriage. Woo! So watch yourselves. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. What's God saying here? God is saying It's easy to have an affair. You don't even have to plan for it. To to not have an affair, you need a plan. So watch yourselves. Don't let your guard down. Don't cheat. Yes, God understands the temptation. And there's grace. But God does not condone sin. If you want to have an affair, just keep on justifying it. Keep saying, God understands my sin. Finally, number four. Everybody say number four. Number four is minimize the consequences. Minimize the consequences. Say things, think things like, this is just a little thing. Listen to your girlfriends who tell you, it's just a little thing. Listen to your boys who tell you, it doesn't matter. It's just sex. Minimize the consequences. This won't hurt anybody. Minimize the consequences and think, but this makes me happy right now. I've got a question for you guys. Who told you you get to be happy all the time? Like for real. Let me say this. Somebody used to tweet this. Christianity is not about being happy. God cares more about your holiness than God cares about your happiness. Oh my God, that's good. 
There is nowhere in the Bible where you're promised you're always going to be happy. You're never promised perpetual happiness. In fact, Jesus once said, if you want to follow me, take up a cross. That's an instrument of execution. And let me just be honest. Some seasons in your marriage, it'll feel like you're carrying a cross. Dry seasons. Seasons when you're picking up his dirty clothes because he's so inconsiderate that he won't pick them up himself. You're picking up a, uh, his dirty underwear and picking up a cross. Jesus never promised you perpetual happiness, but he does promise you ongoing joy. And those are two different things. See, happiness is an emotion. Joy is a disposition. Happiness is based on chemicals and how you're feeling in the moment. Joy is based on a decision that you make. Happiness is based on how my man is treating me. How's he treating me today? Joy is based on how Jesus already treated you and perfected you and made you his righteousness. And and so listen, I love my wife, but my joy is not rooted in how my wife is treating me on this particular day. And for her, thank God, the opposite is true. Happiness and joy are two. So, so yeah, if you want to have an affair, minimize the consequences and think about what makes you happy today. Here's the problem, though, with doing that and prioritizing today's happiness over tomorrow's consequences. Here's the problem. Today always ends. And there are a lot more tomorrows in your life than there is this single solitary today in your life. Consequences come. Remember how that passage ended with David? It said, and God was not happy. Look, of all the relationships I have in my life, the one where I want to try to make people happy is my one with God. David has Bathsheba move into his place. She moves into the palace. She has a baby. David probably thinks no consequences. I got away with it. But there are always consequences. Always. This child dies in its crib. Sowing and reaping is a thing. From this moment forward, David's family is thrown into utter chaos. His his kids try to kill him. His kids try to take the kingdom from him. His kids hate each other. There are consequences. The violent dismembering of the one flesh of marriage has consequences. God can restore, but it's always there. And you may be trading in one flesh for divorce lawyers and custody battles, and swapping kids on holidays. Listen, I work with lawyers on the regular. There's one person I don't want to insert into my personal life. It's a lawyer. You know, there are consequences. So, if you want to have an affair in four easy steps, number one, think that you're immune. Number two, take baby steps. Number three, justify it. And finally, number four, minimize the consequences. Or, everybody say or. Or Or, you could choose. I'm not going to be that man. I'm not going to be that woman. You can make that choice today.